Hello, this is Meteorology 113, Lecture 10, Introduction to Epidemiology. This lecture is for Course Module 4, Air Pollution Epidemiology. Epidemiology is the study of diseases or other adverse health outcomes in human populations and how these are linked to exposures to various risk factors. The terms disease, outcomes, and exposure will therefore come up often in this lecture. In this course, we are focused on air pollution epidemiology, a topic of environmental epidemiology which studies how adverse health effects are tied to air pollution exposure. This is illustrated by this graphic, which pictorially shows the key question, is air pollution linked to adverse health effects. While this may seem true intuitively, epidemiological studies would attempt to determine to rigorous quantitative scientific standards whether increased exposure to poor air quality coincides with increased frequency of specific adverse health outcomes across studied populations. It also attempts to quantify the linkage, that is, to determine how much adverse effect would be expected per unit air pollution concentration exposure. A key question, a key challenge in epidemiology is to properly account for the many other risk factors that may also be associated with the studied adverse health effect besides air pollution. These can include environmental factors, which besides air pollution may include other, in other environmental pollution sources. These can also include many population factors that can be associated with the likelihood of disease in the population. For example, age, smoking, and pre-existing health conditions. Epidemiology attempts to sort all these things out using rigorous scientific methods. This lecture will provide a broad, introdu broad introduction to the topic. The outline for this lecture is as follows. We, pro we first provide background we then present epidemiological study design, and after that, present the topic of causal inference, which is the topic of interpreting results of epidemiological studies. Several subtopics are covered in each, which we'll explain as we go along. This lecture was developed from the original PowerPoint presentation, Introduction to Epidemiology and Study Designs, by Thomas Songer, PhD, University of Pittsburgh and the SuperCourse team. Background. The basic question of epidemiology is whether exposure to a particular contaminant or other risk factor leads to higher rates among studied populations of particular diseases or outcomes. This applies two things occurring. First is the exposure to a particular contaminant or risk factor. We use the term exposure to indicate the contaminant exposure. In air pollution, the exposure would be inhalation of a specific air pollutant with a particular concentration. Second, a specific disease or adverse health outcome is examined. We use the term disease or outcome to indicate this. In air pollution, this may be asthma hospital visitations or diagnosis of coronary heart disease as examples. By linked, as the term here is written out, we specifically mean whether the increased exposure coincides to increased occurrences of disease across study populations. It is important to note that even if an epidemiological study results can establish this association, this does not by itself mean the exposure causes the disease, just that the association exists. Other scientific evidence would also be needed to establish causation. The phrase correlation does not imply causation is often used to express this point. To provide context before presenting epidemiological topics further, we first turn to the classic experimental study most people are familiar with. 
These are often used in clinical settings to test the efficacy and safety of a drug or intervention. In this, study participants are divided into two groups. An experimental group that receives the drug or intervention and a control group that does not receive the drug or intervention. In human subjects, often a placebo is given to the control group, which looks, feels, and tastes like the drug, but is in fact inactive. This guards against one group being aware of taking a medication while the other is aware they are not, which can bias results through the placebo effect. Upon receiving or not receiving the drug, there are four possible outcomes, a positive or negative outcome for each the control and experimental groups. By positive outcome, we mean that the intended effect of the drug occurred. For example, reduced hypertension for a drug intended to lower blood pressure. By negative outcome, we mean that the intended effect of the drug did not occur. A positive or negative outcome can occur for participants in either group, hence four possible outcomes. This experimental study design is further depicted on this slide. The study begins at a particular point in time with the enrollment of a study population. The population is then divided into control and ex into experimental groups. This is the baseline point of the study, at which time the intervention or placebo is applied and outcomes thereafter are observed and recorded. An important aspect of experimental design is randomization, whereby the assignment of study participants into control and experimental groups is done randomly. This helps to guard against the possibility of any selection bias between the two groups or differences in the makeup of the groups that could lead to different outcomes independent of the drug or intervention. The second important aspect is blinding whereby study participants and investigators are unaware along the study which group receives the intervention and which does not. A single blinded study is one where the participants are unaware of this. The placebo in the control group is a means of blinding in this case. A double blinded study is one where both participants and researchers themselves are unaware of which is the control and which is the experimental group. For example, any recordings of data for the two groups will be, will be labeled as group one and group two, rather than control and experimental, so that the researcher does not know which group is which. As with randomization, blinding reduces the chance of differences in results being a result of bias, rather than the intended effect of the intervention. Another term for this experimental study design is randomized control trial. The double-blinded randomized controlled trial is often called the gold standard of experimental studies, the one that provides the most convincing evidence for the efficacy and safety of a drug or other health intervention. A summary of these points is provided here. Experimental studies have a few key disadvantages, however. The first is that they are very expensive. As a result, they are usually a final step after several other benchmarks have been established. The second is ethical considerations, which come up when, hum when studying human subjects if an intervention study is expected to be harmful in some way. The third is the most relevant for us and motivates epidemiological study designs. It is that it is not possible to apply experimental study designs to answer questions about links between exposures and outcomes across human populations in their natural setting. This is because the experimental study, the sp the experimental study design requires a laboratory setting to carefully control exposure. Studying the effect of ambient air pollution across human populations therefore requires epidemiological approaches that gather and analyze data in a natural environmental setting. We will cover some of these main epidemiological approaches later in this lecture.
In these types of studies, experimental or epidemiological, we have the four possibilities mentioned a few slides back, positive or negative outcomes for the two study groups. In, epidemiologic, in epidemiology, we call these the exposed and non-exposed groups, and the outcome disease or no disease. We will use the term outcome and disease interchangeably through this lecture. For example, in air pollution, we may have two groups, one exposed to high and another to low concentrations of ambient air pollution. We then may investigate differences in daily respiratory-related hospital visitations between the two groups. We now summarize how the data gathered in such an epidemiological study are generally presented and analyzed. Seen here is the classic two-by-two two table where the number of participants for each of the four study outcomes are recorded. The rows of the table indicate the two groups, exposed and non-exposed, by E plus and E minus. The columns in the table indicate whether participants got or did not get the disease or outcome. The plus column is getting the disease. The minus column is not getting the disease. The A, B, C, and D entries are then the number of participants in each of the four categories. Specifically, A is the number of exposed participants who got the disease or outcome. B is the number of exposed participants who did not get the disease or outcome. C is the number of non-exposed participants who got the disease or outcome. And D is the number of non-exposed um, participants who did not get the disease or outcome. The entries in the total columns are then the additions of these entries. For example, N1 is the total number of exposed participants, which would equal the sum of A plus B. These symbols are defined here. Here we provide an example of the entries of a two-by-two two table for the above hypothetical study conditions. The students should review the slide on their own and verify their understanding of the entries of the two-by-two two table based on the conditions in the bullets above it. Once entries are placed in the 2x2 two two table, a number of metrics analyzing the results can be calculated. One is the absolute risk, which is defined as the fraction of total number of the particular group that got the disease or outcome. Specifically, the absolute risk for the exposed group, denoted here by R1, is equal to A divided by the total number of exposed participants, N1. This gives the fraction of the exposed group getting the disease, which is the measure of the risk of, ex of the exposed group getting the disease. Likewise, the absolute risk for the non-exposed group is denoted here by R0, which is the total number of non-exposed non people who got the disease, C, divided by the total number of non-exposed participants. This is a measure of the risk of the non-exposed group getting the disease. From absolute risk, we can then calculate what is called the relative risk, or also called the risk ratio. This is simply the ratio of the absolute risks of the exposed over the non-exposed group. The relative risk or risk ratio therefore indicates how much more or less likely the exposed group got the disease compared to the non-exposed group. Below, we can illustrate how this is calculated from absolute risks. 
As covered on the last slide, the absolute risk of the exposed group um, is R1, which equals A divided by N1. The absolute risk for the non-exposed group, R0, equals C divided by N0. Dividing R1 by R0, we then calculate the ratio of the absolute risks of the exposed to non-exposed groups, which is the risk ratio or relative risk. If the risk ratio is greater than 1, the exposed group is therefore more likely to get the disease compared to the non-exposed group. If the risk ratio is less than 1, the exposed group is therefore less likely to get the disease compared to the non-exposed group. Returning to our example from a few slides back, one can then calculate the absolute risks and relative risk from these data. The student should review this slide on their own and verify their understanding of the absolute and relative risk calculations based on the entries in the table. epidemiological study design. A formal definition of epidemiology is the study of the distribution and determinants of disease frequency as it exists in human populations. Epidemiological studies are divided into two types, descriptive and analytical. Descriptive epidemiology is solely dedicated to quantifying the distributions of disease across populations, independent of exposures and risk factors that may lead to getting the disease. It is therefore descriptive, describing the distribution of disease without analysis of dependence on exposure. Analytical epidemiology, on the other hand, attempts to pin down the association between the disease and one or more risk factors or types of exposures that may cause it. It is therefore analytical, analyzing the dependence of disease frequency on these risk factors. As mentioned, epidemiology quantifies the distributions and frequency of diseases across populations. Two common ways this is quantified are prevalence and incidence. Prevalence measures the disease frequency over a population at a particular time, while incidence tracks the occurrence of new cases of a disease over a period of time. In red font are the distinguishing aspects of prevalence versus incidence. Prevalence being a particular time while incidence being new cases over a period of time. Both prevalence and incidence are expressed as number of cases per unit population. For example, 100 cases per 100,000 people. To illustrate this, we show here a graphic of the cancer incidence rate over the U.S. from 1975 to 2007. Since this incidence rate, this is the number of new diagnoses of cancer of all types year by year from 1975 to 2007. The vertical axis gives the incidence rates of number of cancers per 100,000 people. The horizontal is year from, 2000, from 1975 to 2007. This chart gives the cancer incidence rates for men, women, and both sexes. Again, this is incidence rate, meaning tracking of new cases over time. The steady increase over time seen on the chart, although flattening out a bit over recent decade, is due to both the increased number of cancers as well as better ability to diagnose new cases. The spike around 1993 in cancers among males, for example, is largely due to the introduction of new methods to diagnose prostate cancer through blood testing, rather than solely rectal examination. Many more males therefore got tested for prostate cancer around 1993, and therefore a higher rate of prostate cancer incidence was diagnosed that year. 
Descriptive versus analytical study designs are further summarized on this slide. Descriptive studies involve only studying disease without analysis of exposure or risk factors. These therefore involve analysis of case reports and similar data. We will not cover this topic further in this lecture, although the CDC Salmonella video exercise you will view as part of this course module includes some additional material on this topic. Among analytical studies are experimental studies, in particular the randomized control trials we covered earlier in this lecture. We now turn to describing the design of common analytical epidemiological studies. We will cover cross-sectional, case, case control, and cohort studies. We now proceed to cover three types of analytical epidemiological studies. First, cross-sectional studies measure the prevalence of disease and exposure at a given time. That is, data are gathered among the study population at a certain time, say a particular year, and the prevalence of exposures and diseases across the population are calculated. Case control studies, on the other hand, look backwards in time to study the exposures of diseased individuals or cases versus those of non-diseased individual or controls. It is therefore a retrospective study, looking backwards in time by pairing known disease cases with control cases of similar age, sex, demographics, and other characteristics, and analyzing differences in past exposures of diseased versus non-diseased cases. Finally, cohort studies then look forward in time to track the differences of incidence of contracting a disease between exposed and non-exposed groups. It is therefore a prospective study, looking forward in time following an enrolled cohort of individuals with known differences in exposure and tracking differences in, in disease occurrence between portions of the cohort with different exposures. The key differences in the designs of cross-sectional, case control, and cohort studies are summarized on this graphic. As the title suggests, time is the key. Cross-sectional studies only analyze present time, characterizing the differences in exposure and disease occurrence across the study population at that time. Case control studies start at present time with known diseases and non-disease cases and analyze backwards retrospectively in the past to see what the differences in exposure were among disease versus non-disease cases. Cohort studies start at a present time with a selected cohort of individuals with known exposure differences and analyze forward prospectively in the future to see what the difference in disease outcomes are among exposed versus non-exposed groups. In fact, these three types of studies fit into a logical sequence of increasing complexity, cost, and direct evidence of an association of a risk factor to a disease. To a disease. For example, a cross-sectional study may first be done using only present data to see whether an association exists at present time between an exposure and a disease. If there seems to be some association of the disease to a certain risk factor, a case control study may then be done using existing as well as past data from previous years to see if diseased cases were associated with increased exposure to this risk factor. If there still seems to be some association of the disease to the risk factor, a cohort study may then be done, enrolling individuals of different levels of exposure to the particular risk factor and tracking forward in time, therefore gathering new data to see if the exposed part of the cohort gets the disease more so than the non-exposed. A graphical summary of a cross-sectional study is provided here. 
The students should view this graphic to confirm their understanding of a cross-sectional study based on the previous slides. A graphical summary of a case control study is provided here. The students should view this graphic to confirm their understanding of a case control study based on the previous slides. A graphical summary of a cohort, sum, cohort study is provided here. The students should view this graphic on their own to confirm their understanding of a cohort study based on the previous slides. Causal inference. Once data is gathered and analyzed for the two study groups of an experimental or epidemiological study, researchers must interpret the results. In particular, the researchers must determine if any measured differences in outcomes between groups can, with enough scientific certainty, be attributed to the different exposures or treatments of the group rather than other things unrelated. An example problem will help make this more concrete. Say, for example, a research study is designed to investigate the link between smoking and higher incidence of coronary heart disease. Research condu researchers conduct a cohort study. Results are a relative risk of coronary heart disease of smokers to non-smokers equal to 1.25, meaning smokers experience a higher incidence, 25% higher, of coronary heart disease than non-smokers in the study. Can the researchers therefore conclude that smoking is associated with higher rate of coronary heart disease incidence based on these study results? What other possible explanations must be considered? Continuing with this example, the study results were a risk ratio equal to 1.25 for smokers getting coronary heart disease, or the smoker group was 25% more likely to have gotten coronary heart disease compared to the non-smoker group. Broadly, there are two possible interpretations for this result. The first is that smoking is, in fact, positively associated and may even cause coronary heart disease, as evidenced by a risk ratio greater than one for smokers versus non-smoker groups in the study. The second possible interpretation is that there are some other reasons besides smoking that lead to this result. We will cover two of these other possible explanations, chance and the combined effect of bias and confounding. The presentations of these topics in coming slides will be brief and focused on communicating to students the main ideas without getting overly technical. These topics are in fact covered in great length and, and technical detail in statistics courses, especially those related to science, medicine, and public health. Many students in this course may have taken a statistics course at some point, in which case some of the points covered may be familiar. However, the goal here is to provide basic explanations so that students can understand the main concepts without requiring background or a previous course in statistics. We start with chance. This arises due to variations in results due to random sampling that are expected to occur independent of any differences in exposure between the two study groups. Students are likely familiar with the concept of random sample variation. For example, if one flips a coin 10 times, records the number of heads and tails, and repeats the experiment over a number of times, the number of heads and tails would vary for each set of 10 flips. On average, one would expect to get five heads and five tails, but for any particular 10 flips, the results can be different. Researchers conducting experimental epidemiological studies go to great lengths to determine 
if differences in results are due to random chance, or stated more precisely, to determine if random chance can, with enough scientific certainty, be ruled out as an explanation for different results among study groups. A common requirement used to rule out chance is that differences in results must be beyond the 95% confidence intervals, which can be interpreted as the range of results expected to occur due to random chance. If differences are beyond the 95% confidence intervals, then chance can be ruled out and differences in results between groups are deemed statistically significant. Something called the p-value is often quoted alongside study results. When p is less than 0.05, differences in results are beyond the 95% confidence intervals and are therefore statistically significant. If differences in results are within the 95% confidence intervals, researchers then cannot rule out chance, and different results between groups are not statistically significant. When p is greater than 0.05, Differences in results are within the 95% confidence interval and therefore not statistically significant. Sample size is the most important thing under the researcher's control to have a higher likelihood of getting statistically significant results. Sample size is generally indicated by the symbol N when presenting results. The higher the sample size, the higher the likelihood of statistically significant results. This is why researchers try to include as many study participants as possible. Of course, the more participants, the higher the cost of the study. So let's return to our example problem to illustrate these concepts. To remind, researchers calculated a risk ratio of 1.25 for smokers versus non-smokers getting coronary heart disease. The question is whether we can rule out chance as an explanation for this result, of this result, or stated otherwise, if the result of a risk ratio of 1.25 for smokers versus non-smokers getting coronary heart disease is or is not statistically significant. So proceeding, we see here a graphical view of the key result a risk ratio equal to 1.25. The, the depiction indicates two things. First, the risk ratio equal to 1.25 as the peak of the curve, and second, a bell curve spanning left and right of this point to indicate expected variation of the risk ratio due only to random chance. The bell curve is typically used to describe the distribution of values due to random chance since it assumes equal probability of values being higher or lower than a certain value, which would occur during random events. We then place bars left and right of the peak to indicate the 95% upper and lower confidence limits of the distribution. The way to interpret this is that 95% of the expected values due to random chance would fall within these bounds. The 95% confidence limits therefore are a rough measure of the bounds of the bell curve, within which a randomly selected value will fall 95% of the time. We can now pose a hypothetical situation in which the risk ratio equal to one or, in, or a measure that indicates no difference in coronary heart disease between the smoker versus non-smoker group is within the 95% confidence intervals. In this situation, although the measured risk ratio in the study was 1.25, the range of expected variation due to random chance alone, independent of smoking versus non-smoking, includes the point risk ratio equal one which means no difference in coronary heart disease between smokers and non-smokers. In this case, the difference in results that was measured in the study groups, a risk ratio equal to 1.25, would not be deemed statistically significant. That is, researchers cannot rule out an occurrence of risk ratio equal 1 
or no difference between the study groups with enough confidence if the study were repeated many times with different samples. The increased coronary heart disease among smokers measured in the study would therefore not be deemed statistically significant and not interpreted to conclude that smoking is positively associated and or therefore may cause coronary heart disease. Contrarily, a hypothetical situation can be posed where the risk ratio equal one point is outside the 95% confidence intervals. In this case, the researcher can rule out an occurrence of risk ratio equal one if hypothetically the experiment were repeated many times with different samples with enough confidence. In this case, the risk ratio equal 1.25 value that was measured in the experiment would be deemed statistically significant. That is, random chance can be ruled out as an explanation for the measured increased coronary heart disease among smokers in the study. The risk ratio equal 1.25 value measured in the experiment can then be interpreted to conclude that smoking is positively associated and therefore may cause coronary heart disease. We now turn to the second possible alternative explanation we will cover, the related topics of bias and confounding. The concept of bias involves differences in the characteristics of study groups, aside from the studied intervention or exposure, that may lead to different study outcomes independent of the exposure that's applied. Two types of biases are selection and measurement bias. A selection bias occurs when errors are made in selecting participants of the study that would affect the exposed and non-exposed groups differently. For example, during selection of participants for the groups of the smokers versus non-smokers, it could turn out that the average age of the smoking group participant is larger than those in the non-smoking group. A bias was therefore made in the definition of the two groups based on the selection of the participants. A measurement bias occurs when errors in measuring exposures or outcomes affect the two groups in different ways. For example, it could turn out that smokers do not get annual physicals or otherwise go to the hospital as frequently as non-smokers. In this case, diagnosing coronary heart disease may therefore be more difficult for smokers compared to non-smokers. Biases can affect interpretation of outcome differences through confounding, which we will now cover. Confounding occurs when differences in results between study groups is mainly driven by a third risk factor, aside from the exposure or intervention studied. Using the example from the previous slide, it could be that the increased coronary heart disease among smokers versus non-smokers is not due to smoking, but instead due to the fact that participants in the smoker group are older than those in the non-smoker group. In this case, age would be considered the third risk factor that could cause confounding. For a third risk factor to be a confounder, two conditions must be met. First, the presence of the third risk factor must be different in the exposed versus non-exposed groups. That is, the third risk factor must be introducing a bias affecting the two groups. Second, the third risk factor must be associated with the outcome independently of the link between the studied exposure and outcome. We can illustrate confounding and the two requirements for it to occur through graphical depiction. We use our example of smoking versus coronary heart disease to illustrate. Seen here is a triangle with interconnecting arrows. On the top left, we see smoking, which is the exposure being studied. To the right of this is coronary heart disease, which is the outcome being studied. The arrow connecting smoking to coronary heart disease depicts the hypo hypo hypothesized causal link between smoking and coronary heart disease being studied. Below these are age, which is the third risk factor. Note that arrows connect age both to smoking 
the exposure of interest, and coronary heart disease, the outcome of interest. The arrow connecting age to smoking indicates the first requirement for confounding to occur, that the risk factor, age in this case, affects the two exposure groups differently. In our example, the average age of the smoking group is older than the non-smoking group, and hence this requirement is met. The arrow connecting age to coronary heart disease indicates the second requirement for confounding, that the third risk factor, age in this case, is associated with increased coronary heart disease by itself, independent of smoking. That is, older people are more likely to be diagnosed with coronary heart disease compared to younger people, independent of whether he or she smokes. When both conditions are met, we have a situation where confounding can occur. That is, the higher rate of coronary heart disease measured in the experiment in the smoking group may not in fact be due to smoking, but instead could be due to the fact that the smoking group is older than the non-smoking group. As with chance, researchers go to great length to minimize the possibility of confounding by applying careful group selection procedures that control as best as possible for biases, and by applying advanced statistical methods in calculating outcome metrics to adjust for possible confounders. An example of the latter is the adjusted risk ratio, which applies several corrections to the standard calculation of risk ratio covered earlier in this lecture to account for possible confounders.